So I thought I would begin with some reflections on Morris. I actually knew him, and I, I knew him over an extended period of time 
but actually uh, late in his life. As Bob Groves and I were remarking, it's really important for people in this room to remember how young he was when he began to make the innovations that have changed the lives of everybody in the statistical world, at least in Washington, if not more broadly. And so for all of the young people in the audience, um, you're never too young to be able to make an impact. Um, I admire Morris uh, for what he did methodologically and the vision he brought to lots of his enterprises, uh, especially at Census and at Westat. Um, as we know, he was responsible for the sample design in 1940, uh, linked to the census, and he was very deeply involved in technological innovations at the Bureau. Uh, can we bring down the lights? Have we brought down the lights? Okay. I have a nice clear image, but I know from the back it's not necessarily always such. Um, he had a lot to do with bringing the first unit back to the Census Bureau and later the FOSDIC uh, uh, optical scanning system. And use of sampling and use of technology are sort of key themes in the talk that I'm about to do. Um, we were of different generations. And that meant a lot of different things. We thought about statistical models differently in sampling and other contexts. And I recall my first real face-to-face -face meeting with Morris when I was giving a talk on the uh, longitudinal analysis of the National Crime Survey. Uh, so this was in about 1977 in Chapel Hill at this survey symposium. And Morris was sitting there in the front row. And he could barely contain himself. And I got to the end of the talk, and he was the first one up to comment. And he said, we don't do that at the Census Bureau. Um, still thinking that he was at the Bureau after he had been long at Westa doing things. And along the way, and I don't remember the exact words or where it came up in the, his comments, he referred to me as young, naive, and misguided. <laughs> if Morris were here today, at least one of those adjectives would change. <laughs> and over the years we interacted, Committee on National Statistics, and then I actually had the privilege of editing one of his last papers uh, with Tori Delanus and Ben Tepping that appeared in the ISI Centennial Volume. So I thought I would begin with my perspective, and you'll see it doesn't quite fit with the image of Morris I just portray, the census taking is a multifaceted statistical enterprise. Lots of people think it's just a big logistical enterprise, but I want to emphasize the word statistics. And I want to note that there's error at every level, in every component of what the census is. And for me, Error is best viewed in terms of random variables. And random variables play a role in elaborate statistical models. And when I think about census taking, I think about models for census taking and how we can put all of that together. And so think about errors, random variation, errors inducing biases and variability and capturing that uncertainty and taking it into account as you put together the different facets of census taking 
uh, is sort of key to thinking about ways to change and ways to restructure them. And as many of you uh, perhaps know, I am an unrepentant subjective Bayesian, and Bayesian techniques are very well suited for incorporating the kind of propagation of uncertainty that's inherent in putting these pieces together. I won't emphasize the B word a lot. What's interesting to me is when I first came to the Census Bureau, following that exchange with Lawrence in the late 70s, no one else used the word. In fact, models were not part of the lexicon of the Census Bureau at the time. And I'm pleased that when I do say that I'm a Bayesian and I do Bayesian-like things, when I visit with the Bureau now, that although it may be met with skepticism, it's not met with the open hostility that it once was. So, and it, we could probably pass out the handouts at this point. I know lots of people at the back may have trouble seeing some details, and so I actually have reproduced the slides for those who want to make some notes. Okay, so I would like you to think ahead and suppose that the Bureau ran a traditional census for 2030, but no one responded. Worse still, the Postal Service no longer existed, and Congress had cut the Bureau's decennial budget so deeply that no resources were available for non-response follow-up. While I know that this scenario may be difficult for many of you, although perhaps not for John as he thinks about what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, the scenario is not beyond the pale. We may not have a postal service, and we may not even have UPS uh, as a substitute to deliver things on time as we would at this point. So if not a traditional census, what? How might a new census plan meet the constitutional requirements? And I've reproduced here Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution, which talks about the role of the census and the notion that we do an actual enumeration. That nobody knows what an actual enumeration means, however, I think is an important starting point. And so, one of the things I thought I would know is that there is no such thing as a traditional census. The first census, <coughs> done in 1790, was done by U.S. Marshals. And they fanned across the country to get information on the households. And the records showed the names of the householders and the number of others in the household by free enslaved. They were posted on trees. No confidentiality in 1790. And no detailed information on many of the household inhabitants. Demographic characteristics and all names were added in 1850. Race questions, which were critical in the three-fifths compromise, they were the key to the fractional people in the Constitution. Uh, uh, where the, it was there until the Civil War and then changed often radically from census to census. Not always by direction of the government, although sometimes, often by internal decisions within the Bureau. Mail out, mail back, which we now think of as a form of traditional census taking, only came into being in 1960 with full implementation 
1970, and still not for the full country. And sampling for the long form, as we know, was 1940. Sampling was used again at the last minute for non-response follow-up in 1970. An imputation since the Second World War has played a greater and greater role. So what is a traditional census? Uh, this is a picture of a schedule from 1870. Uh, Bill's family, uh, my collaborator Bill Eddy, uh, Bill's family goes back a long way. And his sister has been collecting the census forms and tracking how the family is being recorded. And the interesting thing is, of course, the family is in the census pre-1850, and so you can see something about household composition, but not who they were. And then with 1850 forward, you see names, and you begin to see rotation of people through that household. What about census accuracy? Well, all censuses, including the first, miss people. The only question was how many and how did we know or what did we know? So President George Washington anticipated that there would be an undercount before the returns were in, in the first census and described this in his letter to Governor Morris of New, New York, of New Jersey. And many of the censuses in the 19th century had major undercounts, and that was actually a big issue as we went from the 1860 to the 1870 census, and very large numbers of people had been killed, and suddenly slaves were no longer slaves, and had different status in the census context. The focus of net censor, census undercount became an important issue with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1965. That was important and it was a key issue for the Bureau at the time but that focus on that census undercount is and was misleading from a perspective of census accuracy. And it really wasn't until 1990, with the inception of the targeted post enumeration survey, that we got our first handle on erroneous enumerations. And if you think about that undercount, which subtracts the erroneous enumerations from the undercount or the omissions, uh, that difference actually can be quite small. You could have a zero net undercount and still have very, very large amounts of error. <coughs> you can have all the omissions west of the Mississippi, and all the erroneous enumerations east of the Mississippi, and if their numbers were the same, then their undercount nationally would be the same. Fortunately, it's not like that, but at small levels of geography, these two need to be added rather than subtracted. And so at a local level, what we need to look at, <coughs> I've argued for a long time, was gross error, which is the sum of the two. And the interesting thing about gross error is that it has remained constant beginning in 1990 when we first measured it through to the last census. There was a wonderful release about measurement of undercount uh, following 19, uh, the 2010 census, but buried in the footnotes were the fact that erroneous enumerations were roughly equal to uh, a 
omissions, and they were each on the order of 5%, and so the sum was 10. So we need to look at them separately, but we need to think about the overall accuracy of local data in terms of gross error. Okay, so where are we today? Today we're in a situation where the cost of census taking has skyrocketed from a little over a couple of billion in 1990 to over 13 billion in 2010. Uh, if that would go unchecked, we would be looking at a doubling again for 2020. And nobody in Congress, or even in the Census Bureau, I think, envisions a census that costs that much. So even though the long form was dropped in 2010, and the argument had always been made that the ACS would make census taking cheaper, we have not seen that happen. And estimates of gross error look like they're constant. Non-response costs are escalating. And what we've done is we've seen lots of technological change, but the Census Bureau has not been able, at least to date for census purposes, to capture that technological re revolution and use it to benefit census taking. And then if we look up the street to the hill, we see Congress trying to cut the budgets of absolutely everything. And if you look at the docket for Congress, the census is way, way down. It's not anything you hear about in the news. It's not on the radar of the major players on the hill today. <coughs> so what's the solution to this? Well, we have a few possibilities. We could rely on administrative records. That's been a promise for a long time. We could, some propose, use it to replace the census. We could use it in the field to reduce the cost of follow-up. <coughs> we could use it for missing data. We might be able to use it to get a better handle on gross error. New technologies are around. People began talking about online census forms in the year 2000. There was actually some use of them, not especially uh, active use. Uh, that went off the table. But we could be thinking about tablets and real-time computing in the field. And all of the other innovations that you have in your pocket today are things that need to be on the docket as we move forward. It's not the cell phones and the tablets that you have today that the census needs to work with. It's the technology that will be there 20 years from now or 15 years from now. It's not standard computing, it's quantum computing. It's not Tiger Maps, it's Google Maps and Facebook and other resources that the Bureau needs to learn how to marshal in new and different ways. And I will come back to that. There's also statistical modeling and estimation. And I would argue rethinking in fundamental ways <coughs> what census taking should mean in the US. And perhaps all of those taken together. <coughs> Let me begin with the master address file. It lies at the core of modern census data. It's a register of physical locations. <coughs> it's updated using various lists by a sequential process. It's a somewhat strange process. Household locations can go in and out in sequential updating uh, repeatedly. And uh, it depends on the order of the files that are, are input. One of the interesting questions is whether we can use new multiple record linkage methods 
to address some of the math problems. But I think that um, it's not just the lack of documentation about the math that matters. It's how we think about its role that I would challenge. What I've listed here is probably the crucial nature of what we think about census taking today. It begins with physical location. That's the math. It proceeds to households. Within households, there are families. And finally, within families, there are persons. And rooting all of the operations of census taking in the map is the issue that I want to point to. So our fundamental suggestion is to turn that on its head. Turn everything around and reverse the process. Begin with the people. Get their information. <coughs> and then put them in families. It may be that some people fit in more than one family. Divide them up. And then put the families into locations. Or households. And work the process backwards. And if you really think that everything needs to be rooted to a precise address on a map, do that at the last stage instead of beginning there at the beginning. So what would that do? First, it would remove the role of the map as this overriding way of thinking about census thinking. And it would look to linkage within at the end of the process. It would open the doors to all sorts of other ways to think about census taking, including the generation of individual forms. And it would allow us to build a map in new ways. We could think about remote sensing technology. And we could think about new ways of reporting and using data because census blocks were there as a way for field staff to do the work as they were carrying out what we now call the traditional census. <clears throat> if you're not doing that anymore, you can have different units of reporting, and they may play different roles for the political process as well. So you could easily align with zip codes if that's what made sense, whether it's five digit or nine digit. <coughs> Technology. The Census Bureau was once a leader. It had the first civilian unit back. It was run with paper tapes. And uh, it's no longer the technology leader in any way, shape, or form. And it's not clear that the Bureau should try to do that. Its innovations, whether they were the role of the UNIVAC or FOSDIC or the great work that went into the Tiger geographic system early on, all that's been surpassed. And as I like to point out, my iPhone has much more capacity, not just than the UNIVAC one, but of all of the census computing activities in the early 60s. So the Bureau needs to be able to figure out how to rapidly deploy off-the-shelf technology despite the government procurement process. And um, we all know what that does to virtually everything, but you can't plan for technology 10 years in advance and not make it work, especially as we had happened uh, in leading up to 2010. So what are some of those technologies? Well, they could involve the technologies that other agencies 
in the U.S. government employed. Uh, some of them have been in the news. The Census Bureau tried electronic forms just to see what they would be like. My collaborator, Bill Eddy, filled out the form ten times. Uh, uh, we don't think he was tabulated once from those, although he received four forms at his home in the traditional census because the MAC had four units in his household, which was once divided into four units uh, four decades earlier before he bought the house. Online forms, however, now become a reality. And the Canadian experience is very telling, although it's not necessarily the model that I think we want 
to use as we envision 2030. So it was implemented in a highly structured way to save costs. It's like the traditional census, it just gets filled out differently. And in 2000, they, when they did this in 2006, there were 18% of the households responded online. In 2011, five years later, over half did so. But they were, in, it involved pre-notification. <coughs> The great thing was that you could do online edits, and they could prompt respondents. And um, the Statistics Canada people actually worry very hard about privacy and security. I want to emphasize that I do not believe that going to the internet is a low risk possibility. Anything online is high risk for lots of reasons. But that is not a reason to fail to go online. Uh, the Census Bureau is currently experimenting with online forms. I actually chatted uh, earlier this afternoon with people doing one of these under uh, the Joint Survey Program. We have, with, with our research node at Carnegie Mellon, a project looking at uh, privacy notifications with online forms. But the key thing, I think, is that we need to think differently about online forms. Do we really want to think about pre-notification in the way Statistics Canada did? Uh, because my thought is we want to get away from the math. If it's pre-notification about addresses, then we're still rooted in the old way of thinking individual notifications from Facebook accounts or Google accounts actually would reach a very large fraction of the population today. But we have to remember that in 2030 there may be no Facebook. And Google may have split and be replaced by 10 other companies doing 10 very different things with 10 very different technologies. What should the form look like? It's hard for me to tell you today. I think this is an area where experimentation really will matter. But one thing is certain to me, it shouldn't look like the online form. That's not what doing things online is all about, as people who've done online surveys can tell you. And it does offer lots of great possibilities as people at the Bureau have been discussing. If you have a lot of files on people from administrative records, you could pre-populate a form, you can do record linkage on the fly when an address goes in, you can do address clarification. There are many, many things that are not beyond the possibilities today. What we'll be able to do in 2030 remains open. But what we need to do is allow for information on multiple residences. One of the things about the traditional census was its always goal was to put every person once and only once into the right place. And many people belong in many places. And to think of putting them in one or an only one place may be the wrong strategy. So what about the role of the administrative records? Everybody says they're important. The Bureau has been working on them for a long time. There, there were groups leading up to the 2000 census, another group leading up to the 2010 census, doing a lot of different work. But how close are we to having an alternative based on administrative records alone? I think the record is mixed, despite all of the high-quality work that's gone on today. There's open methodological issues in record linkage, and I'll talk about those briefly. And they require urgent attention now, so that we'll begin to think about what multiple record systems 
are really all about how to manage them. And then we would need to figure out how to reconcile the use of administrative records with that census uh, constitutional language of actual enumeration. There is a standard method for record linkage. And I'm very pleased that one of my discussions, uh, Ivan Velody, had a lot to do with it. In the 1960s, uh, in his younger days at Statistics Canada. Even younger. <laughs> uh, and the Velody Center idea is actually a really neat idea. Uh, what they were able to do is to crystallize an approach to record linkage that was loosely bandied about by many people in somewhat different forms and talk about optimal choices of cutoffs and formal ways to think about probabilities of matching. And the key idea was to take a, a feature vector, which I've labeled here as gamma, and to talk about the probability of that feature record arising out of a match or a non-match, and then to be able to look at the ratio of those probabilities. And that technology involved two different thresholds. And the basic idea was that there are lots of cases that are so clearly non-matches that you want to dispose of them and get them out of the way. And there are actually lots of cases with real matches or very close to full matches that you want to get out of the way. And then all the action goes on somewhere in the middle. And you have to decide when you want to look with care at the detail of records. And there's a, a depiction of what that might look like with lots of true matches for at one end of the spectrum, lots of true non-matches at the other end of the spectrum, and then there's a middle category. One of the questions today we need to confront in record linkage is the extent to which we can afford to do clerical matching and hand matching in the middle of this process. Uh, I'm all for paying serious attention to records. But if we're going to look at large numbers of files and to try to integrate them in different ways, we may need to go in new and different directions. Uh, for those um, who haven't seen this literature, I think it's actually a very exciting statistical literature. One of the things about early record linkage is it sounded like it was deterministic, but clearly with the framework that uh, Ivan and uh, Sunter did, it became probabilistic, and that forced us either to think about it in what we would now characterize as non-parametric ways. Theirs was really a non-parametric way in, 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 in paths. You can move that Felicity Center framework along in a very different kind of way. <coughs> and the screen metrics, the ways for matching names and edit distances are things that computer scientists have looked at, although they've been hard pressed to improve upon the metrics developed at the Census Bureau in the 1980s and 1990s. It's actually interesting because this is an example of a missing data problem. The matches and non-matches are the missing data. And if you put it into a missing data framework, you can run an EM. And so Bill Winkler's big match program is based on the EM characterization of the Felicity Center style process. But that leads to lots of other Bayesian ways uh, to begin thinking about things. EM is just the first step to data augmentation and to the computation of whole possible distributions. And so you have work by Don Rubin and lots of others talking about Bayesian and non-Bayesian ways to bring statistical ideas 
into that process. The problem with multiple lists is that they don't have to agree if you match them pairwise. Okay, so if I take list one and an item A from it, and I link it to list uh, an item B in list two, and then B linked to C in list three, it may be the case that A and C don't link. And so that lack of transitivity of uh, linkages across pairs is only going to get worse as you go from two to three to four to five sets of files. And generalized versions of Felicky Center are easy to do, but conquering the uh, problem of transitivity is one that you have to do, in some senses, systematically and by fiat. And we recently published at least one version for how to do that with some kind of optimal characteristics. As I said, the Bureau has been actively engaged in this. And so there was the STARS and AREX projects from 2010. They were among the most innovative going into uh, in 2000. They were among the most innovative things going into the census. They were not coming up because that activity was not followed through between 2000 and the gearing up for 2010. And so administrative records came back on the table with new people, new tools, and a commitment to look differently. And the recent we released study led by Amy O'Hara's group uh, really showed that uh, you could do a lot with large numbers of lists. But you have to look carefully at what they do and how they do it. Uh, great work, but every list is not matched against other lists. Rather, they're all matched into a common file, the Social Security Numident file. So notice what we've got is, if you think statistically, an assumption of conditional independence. You've got all of these other files linked to one at the core. And given it, you can act uh, about linkages independently. But we know that that's not the right way to think about things. And it doesn't really solve the transitivity problem. Rather, it just pushes files around in different kinds of ways. Their results are intriguing. They've shown that you can actually take large numbers of files and accurately target a very substantial part of the census target population. Not enough to reach the kinds of accuracy that the Census Bureau believes it wants. So we're now back to assessing census accuracy. And uh, the current method is one that I've been involved with in some senses over the last 30 some odd years. It's a highly stylized form of what's called dual system estimation. Capture, recapture for the non-census types in the audience. And um, for those who come from my perspective outside the Bureau, there's a statistical model that lets you think about that. It leads to independence, it has probabilities of, of uh, occurrence and recapture. And um, that's not quite what the Census Bureau does. What it does do is it takes that and it puts it into a sampling-like perspective in which many things get hidden. And this is where the gross error numbers come in and I, where I think we need to redo things. And the big problem here is not capture recapture, despite what some people have said about the methodology. 
The big problem is erroneous enumerations, and how do you get them, and what do you do about them, and what would you do if you had more files to link in as well? Okay, so here's what that process looks like. The census goes out and it takes a sample of blocks. It essentially redoes the census for those blocks. And then it has two sets of files. It has the census files and it has the, the redone files. And it does matching for those. And the first thing it does is it tries to estimate the erroneous enumeration in the original file. They get subtracted out, and then capture recapture comes into play in whatever form. So it looks like the formula that I display here. But in fact, in order to compute the quantity CR, which is a ratio of correct enumerations to correct enumerations plus erroneous enumerations, you have to get erroneous enumerations. And that's essentially subtracting the amount of the process. Uh, the undercount debate was all about doing system estimation. The real debate should have been about the accuracy of erroneous enumerations and how do you get a handle on putting that in to the structure of what's involved? And buried in the middle is Bill Winkler's Big Match program. And it's actually used several times. Uh, and uh, I thought about reproducing for you the, the actual page uh, of the flowchart of how it gets used repeatedly in that process. But it not only is hard to envision, it's also very hard to follow. It's an ad hoc process developed for 1990 and refined in subsequent censuses. It makes lots of sense as a processing <coughs> approach. But what we need to do is ask what it means to do that with multiple files and in different kinds of ways. And where do the errors of record linkage come in? The answer is never. Let me repeat. Where do the errors of record linkage come into any analysis? Never. If we're going to have record linkage that's probabilistic, we need to be able to propagate those errors into the subsequent calculations. And that was the thrust of some of the methods that were bandied about in the 90s. But that thrust somehow got lost in the need to carry the methodology forward. So it's interesting to compare. Everybody now does dual system estimation. Almost every country in the world is busy following the Census Bureau's lead. But they're doing very different things and in different ways. And I want to point to the Israeli model, which actually does two separate surveys, one to get EEs and one to get omissions, and then puts them together with the statistical model so that there isn't that subtraction going on and actually can produce a number, although they still haven't figured out how to propagate the error through to the final state. And I would argue that we need to learn from that and learn about other ways to capture erroneous enumerations, because that's what administrative records are full of. People who don't belong in the places where they are placed by the administrative record. And we need to figure out what to do with them and how to incorporate those data in a systematic way across many files. So, I've come almost to the end. I like to think about record linkage and multiple systems estimation in an integrated way. 
The first thing is you have to put the files together. And that's the record language part. And the second part is multiple system estimation. Uh, we actually have lots of methods for those. Uh, they weren't developed at the Census Bureau, and the Census Bureau has been somewhat low to look at things like log-linear models, Roche models, mixed membership models, all of the things that let you capture both dependencies between lists and heterogeneity among individuals in ways that allow new kinds of inferences and estimation of error uh, in, in interesting ways. And then finally, we have to propagate that uncertainty from record linkage through into those calculations if we're going to ultimately have a full uh, approach to these problems. Uh, you'll notice I haven't talked a lot about the ACS. The ACS is critical for the Census Bureau in lots of ways. It could and it should play an important role, but I don't know quite what. It's not easy to use the ACS directly as another list because of the varying time. It's not quite clear what we should benchmark the ACS against and where it fits into that kind of census process. Indeed, one of the interesting questions is, how do you take advantage of all of the data that reside at the Census Bureau and use it in an integrated way as you move forward in census taking? Why should the 2020 census ignore all the records from the 2010 census? And why should 2030 ignore everything that goes before? So benchmarking and combining are intertwined issues, and I think we need new ways to think about those as well. The Constitution asks for census taking for two purposes, apportionment and taxes. It never got used for taxes. And so the real use is apportionment. And lots of other uses get tagged on to it. We need to think about how to produce uncertainty down to low levels of geography, and maybe not down to the block level, because if we propagated uncertainty that low, we might discover it's very uncomfortable. That is, the level of uncertainty is great. But as you aggregate and put units together, there, there are cancellations, and the uncertainty may not be as great. And so, the thinking that we need census blocks for redistricting, I think, is a figment of some political uh, uh, redistrictor's imagination, uh, probably pushed on by people at the Bureau over a long period of time, who thought that that was how to structure the database. I don't think we need to do that. I think that we need to educate people why we don't do that if we we're going in a different direction. And we should learn about this statistically and then move to reporting at different levels of geography, where some of those errors really will cancel out. Privacy and confidentiality is a major issue for me intellectually, separate from the census. But online forms and the use of record linkage pose privacy problems that the Bureau has never coped with before. They are new, they are bigger, and they are going to be more difficult. People who are willing to give their data to Facebook and Google somehow may not be willing to give it to the Census Bureau, even though all of us in this room trust the Census Bureau much more than Google. Or Facebook, which I don't trust at all with my data. Okay, the time to begin educating people 
starting with us on the hill about this, is now. Not for 2020, but for 2030. Because this is major education for them. And uh, we have to be able to think about the lessons from the past. The Census Bureau has a wonderful group hidden away which does history. Uh, John, you have to keep supporting them. They do great stuff, not just documenting the history of the census as it's happening, but looking backward. And Rebecca Cross wrote a wonderful piece about the National Data Center proposal of 1965. Ill-fated, but its descendants live on. And everybody's thinking. That's what administrative records are really all about. If we thought about carrying census data forward, we're talking about something that to other people look like registers. And registers are not things that people in this country have felt comfortable about, unless they've been explained in different kinds of ways. Uh, part of how you think about these things in the university is by taking proposals to an institutional review board. I think the Census Bureau needs one of those with some outside people. Uh, it's not to control the privacy and confidentiality issues, but to sensitize people to what the issues are that they need to do research on. I'm actually going to skip this movie, uh, uh, but I'll tell you about it later. I want to end with the question that many people ask me when I gave the title and abstract for this talk. Why 2030? Why not 2020? After all, you're going to have all these Census Bureau people here listening to you. There's John. <laughs> and all of his associates and the deputy. Almost every idea I mention is on the table somewhere in Census Bureau thinking, at least in the head of at least one person. Sometimes groups are actively pursuing ideas that are here, record linkage, and it's varied. Every statistical tool I mentioned in my talk today and variants of it are ones that we know. The satellite systems are there. Google Maps is there. But putting them together and testing them as a census requires a different way of thinking. <coughs> I can't tell you how to do the 2020 census, although I can tell you things not to do, John. Uh, and I think that there are many people in this room who, if given the incentives to think ahead, would come up with far better ideas than I put on the table today. For 2030, we can imagine doing things differently. A fundamental shift in focus in the substance of census taking in America. But if we don't begin thinking about that, we'll also miss the opportunity for the educational effort that is going to be required to go with that role and the methodologies of census taking um, if they're really going to be viewed by Congress and the public as fulfilling the mandate of taking an actual enumeration. Thank you.